Hello, everybody, and welcome to Nursing 3370, Module 2, Lesson 7, Alterations in the Neurological System. Our lecture outline for this lesson will include a brief neurological system overview. We will then discuss intracranial pressure, as well as introducing some alterations in acute and chronic neurological function, which will include vascular disorders, seizure disorders, Parkinson's disease, and Alzheimer's dementia. If you call from anatomy and physiology, and I suppose just general knowledge as well, the brain is the central control center for our body. The brain is in charge of receiving, processing, and evaluating inputs and deciding what action to take. Some of these actions are voluntary, while others are involuntary. Involuntary actions include maintaining homeostasis, as well as things that are regulated by the autonomic nervous system. Voluntary actions are consciously thought about and executed and also include our reflex activities. Three layers of the membrane known as meninges protect the brain and the spinal cord. The delicate inner layer is known as the pia mater. The middle layer is known as the arachnoid and it's a web-like structure filled with fluid that cushions the brain and the tough outer layer is called the dura mater. Now, again, a lot of this is review from anatomy and physiology, and it's just a little refresh to remember where the things are located. Uh, it becomes a little more important when we start talking about the diseases and the conditions of the brain. The brain is also protected by cerebrospinal fluid, known as CSF which not only provides nutrients to the brain, but also provides a cushion to the brain and the spinal cord in case of trauma. CSF is very similar to plasma in its, in its appearance, which is relatively clear. CSF is comprised of electrolytes, glucose, and proteins. Cerebrospinal fluid is formed constantly in the ventricles of the brain and flows into the subarachnoid space where it becomes a cushion. One important thing to consider is that since CSF is constantly being created, our body needs to have a regulatory mechanism so the amount of CSF produced and reabsorbed uh, maintains a normal pressure in the head. If I don't reabsorb the cerebrospinal fluid or if it stays in the brain or if I constantly produce too much of it, it's going to increase pressure in the brain. And we're going to get to increase pressure here in just a little bit. Finally, the, br the brain is also protected by something called the blood-brain barrier. We talked about this briefly in our first lessons when we talked about medications that didn't cross the blood-brain barrier. The blood-brain barrier is a barrier at the capillary level in the brain and limits passage of materials into the brain itself. It controls the balance of electrolytes, glucose, and proteins, and it really only allows things that are lipid soluble to cross the barrier into the brain. The blood-brain barrier helps protect the brain from infection, including things we may be exposed to as we eat. The blood-brain barrier tightly regulates what can cross and what can't. It's important to know that the blood-brain barrier is very poorly developed in neonates and more things can cross that barrier and affect babies. This photo shows uh, the various protection layers. You can see the meningeal layer, the broad-brain barrier layer, and then the cerebral spinal fluid. You don't have to memorize this big chart. This kind of just puts in perspective where everything is located. So now we will look at some of the functional areas of the brain. The next few slides we'll use just as a guide. Many of them are detailed with lots of information. The goal isn't for you to memorize all of the information. I will discuss your must know information. Anything that I don't discuss, you won't see again on the test. The functional areas of the brain include the cerebral hemispheres, the diencephalon, the brain stem, and the cerebellum, and each of these serve its very own purpose. So here is this really first busy slide to look at. You can see what different areas the brain is responsible for. You might actually did have to memorize this back in anatomy and physiology, or maybe way back in a high school science class that you took at one point. The reason I share this today is because when we talk about injury to your brain, it's important to know that the area of injury is actually very important on what kind of effects and what kind of symptoms the person is going to suffer after that injury. For an example, if I have an injury in the visual area of the occipital lobe, it can lead to blindness. Injuries to the frontal lobe may cause a change in personality. 
An injury to the Broca's area may cause dysphagia, which is difficulty speaking. You aren't expected to memorize this slide. We will talk about the various areas as we learn about the conditions. Just have that deep understanding that with the brain, the symptoms and effects are correlated directly to the location of the injury. Our brain is supp supplied through several cerebral arteries to get its blood and its fuel. Blood flow in the brain is relatively const constant and it's auto-regulated. It's not the same as normal blood pressure where there is a pretty significant difference between systolic and diastolic blood pressure. Again, the pressure in the brain is relatively constant. There are a few ways in which the cerebral blood flow is auto-regulated in the brain, and those include increased carbon dioxide levels, decreased blood pH, and decreased blood pressure. These all result in immediate local vasodilation, which makes the vessels bigger for easier flow. So that just means if you have a high carbon dioxide level, or if the patient has a decreased blood pressure, uh, pH or decreased blood pressure, that brain is going to self-auto-regulate itself and have vasodilation because it's a it's obviously a priority to get more blood flow to the brain. So that's a kind of a built-in system or those things happen in response to that to try to auto-regulate itself so it doesn't become hypoxis, hypoxic. This is mostly regulated by the baroreceptors and the chemoreceptors. We talked about chemoreceptors in the last module, specifically talking about CO2 being a primary mediator in the respiratory drive. The cerebral blood supply in is arrangement formed by anastomosis between the major arteries. The term anastomosis means come together. So major arteries come together to form the blood supply. Blood flow to our brain is designed to be very redundant because if there's an injury to one area, we don't want the whole brain to die. Located in the middle of the brain, we have this thing called circle of Willis, and this is a group of multiple anastomosis where vessels come together. If there's a blockage there, which we might see on the next slide, you're gonna have redundant circulation that's going to go ahead and provide blood to all of the other areas around that blockage. The circle of Willis is the primary structure for central nervous system circulation. And like I said, it allows for blood to pass even if an artery is occluded in the other side. That's called collateral circulation or that redundant circulation I've mentioned. You can see that circle here is where all of those vessels come together, that circle of Willis. You can see how they all kind of come together. Uh, again, you aren't expected to memorize all of these arteries. It's just important to see that there are several cerebral arteries in the head and um, they, they auto-regulate through those chemoreceptors and they do that redundant circulation. So if an area of the brain is not getting oxygen, it tries to move it around in a different way. Changing gears now from blood supply to neurons. Neurons are the fundamental units of the brain and the neurosystem. The neurons are responsible for receiving sensory input from the external world, for sending motor commands to our muscles, and for transforming and relaying electrical signals at every step in between. Neurons are highly specialized non-mitotic cells, which means they don't participate in mitosis. They don't regenerate and they don't replicate. If a neuronal body is damaged, that cell is damaged forever. Neurons conduct impulses through the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous systems. They require glucose and oxygen for metabolism, just like every other cell. Every neuron in your brain has one long cable that snakes away from the main part of the cell. This cable is several times thinner than a human hair, and it's called the axon. An axon is where electrical impulses from the neuron travel away to be received by other neurons. Dendrites, on the other hand, are appendages that are designed to receive communications from other cells. They resemble a tree-like structure forming projections that become stimulated by other neurons and conduct the electrical chemical charge to the cell body. And you can see that neuron anatomy here. And I'm pretty positive somewhere along the way, you likely had to diet, uh, identify this. I can't even remember where what level it would have been, like cell biology maybe? I don't know. I remember way back when we had to draw all these things. Of course, that's been such a long time ago. Um, and again, our takeaways here are what happens um, when these things aren't functioning well. That's the level of patho that we're uh, discussing. Synapses refer to the points of contact between those neurons where information is passed from one neuron to the next. Synapses most often form between axons and dendrites. Synapses are these gaps in the places where the neurons come together and are able to act and elicit a certain effect. 
neurotransmitters are released into the synaptic cleft on stimulus and lead to a neuronal depolarization, which is going to pass the electrical signal along. Depending on what the neurotransmitter is telling it to do or what that, serve, that nerve is designed to do. I encourage you to review the crash course videos that are posted and review some normal anatomy, normal physiology for the neurologi neurological system. It's important to know that any disruption in the central nervous system, physical structure, or action of our neurotransmitters can lead to alterations in normal neurological function. Remember these neurotransmitters, they're the chemical messengers. They're telling the body what to do. This table, again, are our primary neurotransmitters. We should be familiar with acetylcholine, dopamine, and norepinephrine, which we've already talked about with the autonomic nervous system. Additional neuroceptors are serotonin, GABA, and glutamate. You are not required to memorize these different trans transmitters, but just understand that any alteration in how these neurotransmitters act or interact with tissues in the central nervous system or any actual damage of the central nervous system is going to negatively impact normal neurological function. And some of these you might have heard in other areas like serotonin. Maybe you've heard about um, taking melatonin to help sleep because serotonin helps um, with our sleep function. Or maybe you have heard of or know of some people who are taking um, antidepressant medications, which are usually SSRI, serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Um, those are what are used in depression to help raise serotonin in our brains. Again, just have a basic understanding um, of the ones we've kind of already viewed, reviewed and the newer ones we just introduced, you aren't, you aren't expected to memorize those. Okay, so moving on to endocranial pressure that pressure that we've started talking about a little bit. Our brain is encased in a rigid, not expandable skull that does not stretch and it's not compressible. Blood and cerebral spinal fluid are liquids that are also not compressible. Intercranial pressure is the pressure exerted by fluids inside the skull and on the brain. The body has several mechanisms in place which helps keep the ICP stable. So ICP is the abbreviation for intercranial pressure. The amount of blood and CSF is a relatively fixed in the brain. It really doesn't change all that much and it shouldn't, but if it does, changes in increased, uh, changes in intracranial pressure are attributed to volume changes in one of the fluids. Either there's too much blood or too much cerebral spinal fluid. And again, those fluids aren't compressible. If we have an increase in one of these, it will lead to pushing on the brain tissue. If there's edema or swelling in the brain tissue, it can also increase intracranial pressure. When this happens, there's a compression of some of the blood vessels. If there's more fluid and there's tighter space, those blood pressures are going to collapse and it will compress some of the conduits for cerebral spinal fluid to the point where they're no longer able to circulate in these areas. This can lead to ischemia. And remember, ischemia is that lack of oxygen causing that tissue death. And if we have uh, ischemia with lack of oxygen, we might have that infarction. And sorry, that infarction is actually that tissue death. If you recall, um, that infarction is that deficit of oxygen or lack of block uh, flow or a blockage, and anything that's beyond that will um, will have result in tissue death. Increased intracranial pressure is common in many neurological problems. A brain hemorrhage is when blood is where it's just not supposed to be in the brain. It will lead to swelling and free blood in the brain. Trauma can also lead to swelling in the brain. Head injuries are a big deal in motor vehicle accidents, ATV accidents, snowmobile accidents, um, sports injuries. Um, any sort of thing that you hit with the brain can cause trauma and swelling. This is known as cerebral edema. Infection, tumors, and too much CSF, which is called hydrocephalus, can also lead to increased intracranial pressure and neurological deficits. The photo on the right shows the composition of the skull. The brain is the biggest thing inside the skull and it makes up about 78%. Intervascular blood makes up about 12% and CSF, which again is that protective barrier, makes up about 10%. Any increase in any one of these is going to either decrease or increase the pressure uh, beyond what's intended to be held within the brain. There are signs and symptoms associated with increased intracranial pressure. The early signs are really important to notice so we can quickly do something about it. Signs include decreased level of consciousness or decreased responsiveness. This is a very early sign. We may also see decreased pupillary responses, meaning their eyes don't have that response like they should. They don't constrict or dilate like they should. The person might experience a severe headache from stretching of the dura and the walls of the enlargement of the blood vessels. 
The person might vomit, especially if the pressure is located near the vomiting center in the brain. See, remember we talked about where the brain has injury, the symptoms will be a little different. So not everybody with increased intracranial pressure will vomit, uh, but that is one symptom that might happen. Uh, you also actually might see projectile severe violent vomiting, which is a result of pressure stimulating the emetic center in the brain, uh, directly in the medulla actually. Late signs of increased intracranial pressure are ominous. Ominous meaning it's not a good sign. Cushing's triad is a late sign of significantly increased intracranial pressure. With Cushing's triad, we see these three different things. We see an increased pulse pressure, and pulse pressure means the systolic blood pressure and the diastolic blood pressure. Remember the top number and that bottom number? They start to separate and spread apart. They get farther and farther apart. This is a reflex because if the pressure in the brain is high and it's not getting good circulation, the body is going to respond by trying to increase blood pressure in order to compensate for that high brain pressure to try and force blood into those vessels to perfuse the brain with oxygen. We will see a decreased heart rate and a decreased respiratory rate. These things together known as Cushing's triad are very bad signs. If you are a nurse or if you are in healthcare and you see this, you know this is an emergency. We don't have very long to act because untreated increased intracranial pressure, especially with this cascading of symptoms, can rapidly lead to disability and death. This photo here is a visual guide of what we've just reviewed with increased intracranial pressure. It pulls together the signs and symptoms. Um, we haven't gone over the seizures yet, which is a condition in itself, which we'll get to in a few slides, uh, but you can pause here and just kind of review the side effects. Um, the posturing, you aren't expected to memorize those. That's pretty detailed, uh, but just know the changes in the speech, eye changes, changes in increase, uh, changes in um, level of consciousness, headaches, and that Cushing triads, which is a late sign and, and again, very dangerous. Very scary if you're in healthcare. So we will start a review of neuro. So that was just a kind of an overview of the, how the brain, how it works, how the fluid um, and everything inside the brain um, and how it can impact things. We'll now start a review of neuro disorders by covering vascular disorders that include uh, transient ischemia attacks, cerebral vascular accidents and cerebral aneurysms. So transient ischemic attacks. I'm only gonna say that once because it's actually kind of hard to say transient ischemic attacks. Um, it is medically abbreviated as TIA, and these are essentially mini strokes. You've maybe heard someone had a mini stroke or a TIA before. They are a series of neurological deficits which occur more than once, and for the most part, they follow through the same pathology as a stroke, which we'll talk about um, in a little bit. Uh, but they result in only temporary localization reduced um, reduction of blood flow in the brain, which can happen from a partial occlusion of an artery due to a floating blood clot or a very narrowed vessel in the brain due to atherosclerosis, meaning um, like high cholesterol. It can also be due to small embolus, which is a piece of fat or air in the blood that gets itself lodged in a small blood vessel. So essentially it's that that blood vessel isn't totally occluded. It's not totally clamped down. Some blood flow can get through, um, but it is severely limited. Uh, it can also be caused, TIAs can also be caused by a vascular spasm or a loss of a, a auto regulation of the brain. The symptoms of a TIA are directly located to the location of ischemia. You're going to notice that that's a common uh, trend here with the brain. Again, it's directly located to where that ischemia is. If you recall a, a table a few slides back that showed the different functions in the different areas of the brain, the symptoms of TIA are directly related to where that injury is located uh, and which part of the brain is specifically not getting enough blood flow and oxygen. Usually the TIA episodes are short and intermittent and resolve in a relatively short time frame, and I'm talking like minutes. A TIA may have visual disturbances, numbness, or paresthesias in the face, aphasia, which means difficulty speaking, or you might see confusion. Again, this all depends on the area of the injury, but the big thing with a TIA is they are only temporary, but they are also a major red flag for a possibility of having a future cerebral vascular accident or a stroke, which is an irreversible injury. 
TIAs are temporary ischemic episodes and are a warning sign that the body is sending, saying, hey, something more serious might happen. A stroke might happen down the road, which is much more serious with much more serious complications. All right, I'm trying to pause my screen here. I need a drink. Okay, a cerebral vascular accident, which is abbreviated CVA, is more commonly known to you and I as a stroke. A CVA or stroke, I'm going to use those words probably interchangeably. It means the same thing. It means this big long word of cerebral vascular accident. A CVA is an infarction of brain tissue that results in lack of blood that does not resolve like a TIA. Strokes have two different causes. They can either be hemorrhagic or ischemic, and we'll review those in the next few slides. I mentioned TIAs are reversible and short. The main thing with a stroke is that it only takes about five minutes before ischemia can lead to irreversible damage. And that damage is truly dependent on the size of the blockage and the amount of time that's involved. When ischemia happens for a length of time, we start to see a central area of necrosis with function loss and irreversible damage. After that, there will be an area of inflammation and damage around that necrotic area. Remember, a necrotic meaning tissue death. If we act fast enough, we can sometimes get that function back. We are really working against the clock with strokes, and there's been a lot of marketing strategies lately, so maybe you have even seen um, some commercials about getting immediate help, um, the kind of common symptoms that you might see in getting immediate help with people who have uh, stroke-like symptoms. Many um, hospitals now have what's called a stroke alert puts a team on standby when EMS, um, the ambulance is out getting the patient and they think it's a stroke, they immediately call into the hospital and initiate that stroke protocol right away. Like the patient sometimes doesn't even hit the ER, they go immediately to the CAT scan and um, really start to get immediate treatment for these strokes. As we have mentioned, there are two different types of strokes. Ischemic strokes are the most common and the most survivable. Ischemic strokes are an occlusion of a cerebral blood vessel, which leads to loss of flow or uh, blood flow or tissues or target areas in the brain. The occlusion is oftentimes an atheroma, which is similar to plaque in a heart attack. We'll learn a little bit more about heart, pla heart plaque in a future module. Or it can also be an embolism, which is caused by a blood clot floating in the vessels or air that gets lodged somewhere in the vessel, which occludes blood flow downstream. downstream. Atheromas can develop in larger arteries, whereas emboli can occur in very small arteries. So essentially the ischemic strokes are, are clots or a blockage. There's a clot of some sort or a, a fat blockage of some sort. And so the blood flow can't get downstream. So what is beyond that clot uh, doesn't get oxygen and doesn't get blood. Hemorrhagic stroke, on the other hand, is a rupture of a cerebral blood vessel that leads to free bleeding in the brain. Uh, it leads to loss of circulation in the area where that blood is. A hemorrhagic stroke is also known as an intracerebral hemorrhage or essentially known as bleeding in the brain that can occur um, sometimes with severe untreated hypertension. That's why you've maybe heard your blood, your, um, blood pressure so high you're going to have a stroke and we use that kind of casually, but we really shouldn't because um, I think we use that sometimes as like, you know, giving someone a hard time or teasing them that your blood pressure is so high you're going to stroke out, but it's a real thing. Severe untreated hypertension can lead to this hemorrhagic stroke. Uh, bleeding in the brain is not just a local effect. Bleeding in the brain isn't just right or left. Um, when you have a blockage, it's only on the right side, right? It's like isolated to that area. Um, bleeding happens freely. It happens all over the brain. It can be complicated by secondary effects of bleeding, like just the blood loss itself, because um, it's not in the vascular system where it belongs. So you're going to have maybe some systemic signs too. Uh, the bleeding can profoundly irritate the brain tissue. It shouldn't have blood on it, right? It should be within the vessels. So that bleeding can irritate the brain tissue. This type of stroke is by far the deadliest. If a hemorrhagic stroke isn't noticed very, very quickly and treated very quickly, the chances of death are greater than 75%. So this photo just helps show the different path pathophysiology between the two types of stroke. You can see the ischemic with that blood clot in the vessel. And then you can see that hemorrhagic stroke, that um, bless, blood vessel is bursted and there's open free bleeding in the brain. Risk factors for stroke include diabetes, high blood pressure, atherosclerosis, uh, it, a history of TIA. So again, that warning sign, a history is a risk for a stroke. 
um, increasing age, obstructive sleep apnea, heart disease, smoking, and sedentary lifestyle. Additional risk factors um, include smoking while taking oral birth control. Hormones, particularly progesterone and cigarettes, also include the, increase the risk of blood clots. There are also congenital malformations of blood vessels, which is when the blood vessels, um, they are in a spot they shouldn't be, or they're weak in points that they shouldn't be, uh, and that can increase the risk of having um, blood vessels ruptures. But you notice if we talk about um, from the past, um, modifiable versus unmodifiable, I mean, there's not a lot that the patients can do about that, but everything else on that list, well, except increasing age, um, they can they can try to work on right. You can work on sedentary lifestyle and smoking and heart disease and all those sort of things, and even sleep apnea. You can get you can be treated for it. Um, increasing age um, does increase to a higher risk of stroke. Signs and symptoms of stroke. You guessed it. Depends on the location of the obstruction or the size of the artery involved. Hemorrhage severity depends on the location of the artery. The artery can either be in the intercerebral space, which is going to cause direct injury to the brain. It can also be in the subarachnoid or subdural space where we have some arteries as well, which doesn't necessarily lead to direct injury to the brain tissue, but increases pressure on the brain. If I start getting blood between my brain and my skull, it's going to start pushing on that brain and lead to very similar symptoms to an infarct. Uh, you can see here that when it is that uh, blood clot type, uh, right brain injury affects the left side of the body and vice versa. Um, it just, again, depends on what area of the brain is involved. So this is a photo representation, again, of the stroke and associated symptoms. You can pause it here and review this. It um, kind of pulls it all together on what you might see with the stroke. Um, the facial drooping, the, the kind of the classic symptoms that you think about um, that most people probably know about are the facial drooping, the one-sided weakness. Uh, but keep in mind, it can be all of the other things on this list as well. So we don't want to get tunnel vision when we're assessing patients and only look for what we, uh, the most common things. It can be all of these on the list. Treatment of stroke will depend on the type that occurs. If the reason is a blood clot, one of the main treatments will be a thrombolytic, which will help break apart the clot. We're going to learn a little bit more about thrombolytics and heart disease uh, when we get to that unit. Um, but for here, we'll learn that these medications are used to help break up that clot in the brain. These medications can be very dangerous to use, though, so we only use them for stroke if we absolutely have to. If there's a blood clot that's going to harm the brain, sometimes we take the risk and give them this clot buster. Uh, giving them this medication, though, is going to dissolve all the blood clots in their body, which might be problematic. If you had recent surgery or a recent injury in a blood clot form to stop that bleeding, this medication is going to break up that clot too, clot too, which could lead to more major bleeding. Uh, if you're brushing your teeth too hard, uh, you might start bleeding for your glands. Uh, thrombolytics is not a desirable inter intervention, but it is one that we do when we absolutely have to. That's why it's really important to get a really good history on these patients because it's really all tied to signs, symptoms, uh, what the CAT scan, fo CAT scan found, and how long the symptoms have been present. Other interventions include surgery where we go in and stop the bleeding or we remove the clot. We can also use interventional radiology to break up the clot. We can also treat the patient with glucocorticoids, which we talked about in the last lesson. Glucocorticoids are anti-inflammatory medications, and if we want to reduce the amount of swelling associated with the brain injury, glucocorticoids can be helpful. And then finally, we can offer supportive treatment. If someone has an infarct leading to long-term deficits, our goal then at that point is going to be to try and return this person to as much normal activity as we possibly can. A support for a person who's had a stroke is going to include occupational uh, therapy, which helps them, you know, do their daily livings, combing their hair, brushing their teeth, eating their food, um, you know, not just the eating part, which is more the speech language pathologist, but the cutting, how to use a knife and a fork and all those sorts of things. Physical therapy will obviously be to help regain um, muscle strength and muscle control and whatever side there was a weakness. And again, speech language pathologists um, to help with speech and eating. All of these have the goal of helping try to restore as normal function as possible. They're a very important part of recovery. We can also work on stroke prevention by help controlling diabetes and blood pressure to reduce the risk of stroke in the first place. <laughs>
Changing gears now to cerebral aneurysms. Cerebral aneurysms are weaknesses in the wall of an artery, usually located at a point of a bifurcation or anastomosis. Bifurcation means where something splits off, uh, usually around the circle of Willis. We'll take a look at the picture on the next slide. It's when two blood vessels come together, it creates a weak spot in the vessel. This can sometimes bulge and lead to an aneurysm. Oftentimes we see aneurysms in people, again, who have high blood pressure. So no joke, it's really important to control the blood pressure. If there's a lot of pressure on the vessel and there's a weak spot, the vessel may be able to overpower the weak spot in that vessel. Um, the pressure pushing against that weak spot, it's just gonna overpower it. The aneurysm will then burst. So the side of that wall can burst, which can lead to the symptoms of a hemorrhagic stroke. If an aneurysm ruptures, especially in the circle of Willis, it can lead to sudden and often fatal increases of intracranial pressure and very quickly death. Early symptoms are minimal, but you might see headaches and visual disturbances. And I said minimal because again, this happens very fast, um, particularly in those areas of major anastomosis where there's lots of um, arteries coming together, uh, which is again, where most of these occur and they're usually very quickly um, deadly if they rupture. Here's a photo of the aneurysm. Again, if there's too much pressure, there's a weakness, it bulges out. The one here shown is called the berry aneurysm because it kind of looks like a berry on a tree. Um, you can see on both sides here, the kind of up here where that berry is, um, and then kind of over here. It's pointing right here where that aneurysm is. Treatment is focused on reducing that intracranial pressure and cerebral vasospasms, which includes lowering the pressure, uh, the blood pressure as much as we can to keep it from bursting. Ultimately though, oftentimes these require surgical intervention to fix. There's a couple of different procedures we use. A uh, clipping is a procedure in which a clip is placed over the aneurysm, which allows it to heal shut. Another procedure is to coil it where they actually use a wire and go into the vessels in the brain and feed a small wire into the aneurysm, essentially to make it turn into a clot. And then finally, we can place a stent, which is when mesh is placed inside the artery or vein to take the pressure off that weakened area of the wall. Your neurosurgeons are the one that do these uh, types of procedures. Seizures, I'm sure people have heard of seizures. Um, they are abnormal or uncontrolled neuro neuronal discharges in the brain. Seizures affect consciousness, motor activity sensation, and typically they're a symptom of another underlying disorder. They are the most common serious neurological problem affecting children, and typically they present as acute situation, but they can also be chronic. For the most part, seizures are a non-emergent emergency. If we know why the person is having a seizure, for example, someone who has chronic epilepsy, uh, having a seizure is something we expect that's going to happen for them. So uh, it, that's why we say it's not emergent as long as we're providing them support, treatment, and care. Uh, it's not necessarily emergency as long as we're um, you know, providing some support and standing by these patients. There are a few known causes of seizures, what leads to the seizure in the first place. Uh, that includes infectious disease, trauma, metabolic disorders, vascular disease disorders, and pediatric disorders such as epilepsy. We're going to cover epilepsy here in just a minute. Uh, and sometimes neoplastic diseases like cancers. Some medications may also lead to seizures, including anesthetics, drug abuse, and specifically drug withdrawal. People who rapidly withdraw from drugs um, are prone to seizure-like activity. And finally, a condition in pregnancy known as eclampsia, which is very high blood pressure, is a lot more than just high blood pressure, but um, the easy answer is high blood pressure in pregnancy um, can lead to seizures as well, a little more complicated than that, but that's all you need to know at the moment. Epilepsy is a chronic condition that leads to seizures. Epilepsy is more of a syndrome than a diagnosis. We don't necessarily understand why seizures with epilepsy happen, uh, but it is somebody who is prone to seizure um, over and over and more than once gets a diagnosis of epilepsy. Epilepsy is classified by a few different kinds, which include partial, generalized, and special syndromes of epilepsy. We'll talk about each of these different kinds and the signs and symptoms, which um, actually are similar to stroke. Again, depends on the area of the brain with the abnormal activity. The symptoms aren't similar as a stroke. I guess what I meant on this slide is what I've been saying all along. It depends um, on the area of the injury. So for Stroke, the area of injury depended on the, where it was bleeding or a clot. For seizures, it depends on the area where the neurons are firing when they shouldn't be. 
Seizure classification, partial seizures include simple partial or complex partial. Simple partial seizures can just be a little bit of twitching in one arm or leg. Uh, you might have some auditory or visual hallucinations. The person might have some intense emotions and perhaps um, the twitching like you expect of the arms, legs, and face. Complex partial seizures are typically preceded by an aura, A-U-R-A. -A. An aura is a sensation where somebody feels or senses that they're going to have a seizure before it actually happens. And I think that's kind of how the seizure dog works. I don't know if you've seen those where people have um, seizures and the dog can sense that it's going to come on and they, and they alert their owner. Oftentimes, there's a brief period um, of confusion or sleep sleepiness with no memory of the seizure and no response to, to verbal commands. The next category of seizures is generalized seizures, and that includes absence, atonic, uh, drop attacks, or tonic-clonic grand mal. Absent or petite mal seizures typically last only a few seconds. It's most often seen in children. The child might be talking to you, and then all of a sudden they just exit the conversation, stare into space, and they don't reply. Sometimes you'll see fluttering eyelids or jerking, but not often will they have any additional physical signs. This is often misdiagnosed because a child might just pe be perceived as inattentive versus being mentally absent. It's pretty hard to differentiate. It can be hard to differentiate where the child just isn't listening and they're truly actually wandering off and having a, a little seizure. It's still a form of epilepsy and it's these small seizures in which a brain shuts, a child's brain shuts down just for a short time uh, and then it turns back on and they just go about their day. The atonic seizure, which is the drop attacks, they might fall or stumble suddenly for no reason. These ones only last a typic, uh, typical few seconds. And then finally, the seizure that you are probably most familiar with is going to be the tonic-clonic seizure. Uh, it's a generalized seizure known as a grand mal seizure or a ton uh, tonic-clonic. Grand mal is probably the word you've heard. Similar to that complex simple seizure, people with tonic-clonic seizures have an aura or a sensation that precedes the actual seizure. Seizures like this often have intense muscle contractions. It's kind of what you've pictured somebody, you know, maybe in the movies or TV having a seizure, followed by contraction and relaxation of the muscles. It's a jerking type of seizure where the muscles are very tight and then they relax. Sometimes you can hear crying in the very beginning because the di diaphragm is also contracting and air um, can leave the lungs. Sometimes you'll get, it can't leave the lungs, sorry. Sometimes you'll get a loss of bowel and bladder control. You might see shallow breathing with periods of apnea, which typically lasts a few minutes. And um, after a few minutes, most tonic clonic seizures do kind of self-resolve. Once they resolve, though, the person enters a period called postictal state. Uh, this is when there's been, you know, think about it. There was major neuronal activity where the brain has just been firing like crazy and firing like it shouldn't be. And all these neurons are firing over and over as well as uh, major physical work from their muscles. They're spasming, contracting, tightening up, spasming, contracting, tightening up. That's a lot of work. After it, they enter this postictal state, which is like disorientation or a deep sleep. It takes a while after the seizure uh, for the brain and the body to reset. Finally, there's a category of special syndromes for seizures. Febrile seizure is actually one of the most common in children when the children has a high fever. And it's not just a high fever, it's the rapid increase in fever too, that they um, that they go from like, you know, whatever number, and then they make a really big jump to that high fever. Um, they can often have a seizure. This is an urgent concern, but not necessarily a medical emergency, but don't tell that to any mother. I was a nurse for a long time when my um, nine month old had a seizure and it was like one of the scariest things in my entire life. And it feels like an emergency. She was blue, she was rock hard. She's 19 now and she was fine, but it is certainly scary when they happen. Typically, it only lasts one to two minutes, which is absolutely true. She was done having it by the time the ambulance even got there. They restop and they return to consciousness without a major post-dictal state, post state. She wasn't very sleepy for very long, like with your grandmas. A myoclonic seizure is when a major muscle group, such as one arm or one leg, has large jerking movements. Uh, they might drop what they're about to hold, what, like what they're holding on to, or they might fall down to the floor. Finally, we can have what's called static eleptic, ep epilepticus, sorry, status epilepticus. I want to say status asthmaticus, but we're not on that unit anymore, right? So status epilepticus is a medical emergency. This is a continuous seizure that lasts several minutes and doesn't resolve. The problem is the patient isn't breathing, their muscles are working really, really hard, which can lead to major electrolyte imbalances, of course, pH imbalances, and it can eventually lead to death. These are 911 calls and you need to get help there uh, right away.
So we're only going to touch a little bit on anti-seizure pharmacology because there's so many different anti-epileptic drug, epileptic drugs available. Choosing an anti-epileptic drug depends on the type of seizure in the patient's history. Regardless of the medications we choose, we're going to start low and go slow. The starting dose will be very low to see how the patient will tolerate and will gradually increase over time. Medication for epilepsy most often need to be taken forever, except, um, so for epilepsy, let's just say that those epilepsy, again, are those ones that have chronic seizures all the time. They need to be taking this medication forever and they can't drive if they're not on vacation. There's a lot of restrictions that come along with it. The ones that don't need to be taken forever, like in pregnancy, if we're at risk for seizures, you might just be on it during pregnancy. And again, those ones that are random and rare, like the febrile seizures, those patients don't go on medications. It's the ones who are on epilepsy that will be um, on medications and most likely um, be on them indefinitely. The goal of long-term therapy is to suppress neuronal activity enough to prevent abnormal or repetitive firing of the neurons and try and prevent the seizure from happening in the first place. It's primarily, primarily directed at controlling movement of electrolytes across neuronal membranes. There are three main mechanisms in which they work. Anti-epileptic drugs, um, abbreviated as AED, don't confuse that with your CPR class if you're CPR trained and that's called an AED. In this case, it's uh, anti-epileptic um, drugs. They work through potentiating the effects of GABA, which is a neurotransmitter. You can slide back a handful of slides and look at that neurotransmitter page and re refresh yourself with GABA. Um, it can make it more effective. Um, the drugs can help delay the influx of sodium or the de delay the influx of calcium into the neurons, which the sodium and the calcium are what um, lead to the, neur the neurons firing. So the drugs will kind of focus on these three different areas. You can pause here and visualize the slide. Again, I always tell you these big, busy slides, you aren't required to memorize the whole thing. This just shows how the seizures your medication suppresses the neuronal uh, activity. And I think probably the most important is if it's epilepsy, you start low, go slow, and they need to be on them indefinitely. Parkinson's is, is the most common degenerative central nervous system disease, and it is due to a progressive loss of the hormone dopamine. Loss of dopamine can lead to a lot of different symptoms, which include tremors, muscle rigidity, bradykinesia, which is very slow movements, which can make it difficult to walk, chew, swallow, or speak. Parkinson's can also cause postural instability, making the person more prone to falling. They have a shuffling, staggering gait. Mood can also be affected. They present themselves as flat and non-dynamic. They may speak in a very flat and unemotional tone. The primary, uh, Parkinson's is primarily a motor disorder, but patients can often experience other health-related issues with Parkinson's, such as anxiety, depression, sleep disturbances, and dementia. Although it's not necessarily related to Parkinson's itself, they may experience other autonomic nervous system disturbances, such as difficulty urinating. The pathophysiology of Parkinson's is degeneration and destruction of dopamine producing neurons in the brain. If there isn't enough dopamine in the brain, it affects the corpus striatum in the midbrain, which is the receptor site for both dopamine and acetylcholine, which remember are parasympathetic nervous hormones, nervous system hormones. The corpus striatum is responsible for the control of balance, posture, muscle tone, as well as involuntary movements. Tremors and muscle rigidity are due to the corpus striatum not getting enough dopamine. Treatment of Parkinson's disease is focused on trying to restore the balance of dopamine and acetylcholine. We will give these medications that try and increase dopamine circulating and dopamine in the brain. We may also give anticholinergics in an attempt to reduce the amount of acetylcholine and hoping bring the acetylcholine and dopamine back to balance because remember, they kind of offset each other. Dopamine agonists are given to restore the balance of dopamine and acetylcholine. Dopamine agonists try to increase the amount of circulating dopamine by increasing the biosynthesis of dopamine itself. We don't give direct dopamine. It's This is a drug agonist, which means it helps that increase the biosynthesis of dopamine itself. The reason we don't just give dopamine is because dopamine is a very strong sympathetic hormone. 
It's one of our catecholamines and it typically has a lot of fight or flight responses associated with it. So just giving dopamine is going to lead to some very unintended and adverse side effects. The other problem is that with synthetic dopamine or dopamine that we could give as a medication, it does not cross the blood brain barrier. I can give as much dopamine as I want, but it's not going to fix the problem in the brain where I don't have enough dopamine because the dopamine is not going to cross that barrier. Levodopa is the most common medication we give in this category. You can see the others there, but by far the levodopa is the most common medication in this class. Dopamine agonists have some side effects, which include skin irritation, dizziness, lightheadedness, difficulty concentrating, confusion, anxiety, and headaches, along with everything else you see on this list. These are all relatively minor side effects, though. While the list is long, they are minor side effects. The major effects can be acute MI or myocardial infarction, which you'll learn about in the future as a heart, future as a heart attack because these medications can place too much stress on the heart, which makes sense, too much fight or flight. Um, too much stress on the heart. Major side effects also include shock, hallucinations, depression, and suicidal tendencies. Also includes this extra pyramidal symptoms, which is underlined, which we're going to go over next, and then liver failure. So these extra pyramidal symptoms are at risk with these medications. They're almost pseudo-Parkinson-like syndrome. Um, it almost looks like they have Parkinson's, which is a, which um, gets worse when you give these medications. Um, it's not necessarily an adverse reaction to the medication, but it can occur with these medications. The ones that we see which are concerning with these type of medications are people with, with Parkinson's are things like acute dystonia, which includes facial grimacing, an upward eye movement tick, or unnecessary unwanted movements of the face, um, unwanted movements of the mouth, the tongue, you might see lip smacking or laryngeal spasms. It can be difficult to breathe on these medications. Part of dyskinesia is also similar. You see a protrusion and rolling of the tongue, sucking and smacking movements of the lips, a chewing motion, a facial dyskinesia, and those involuntary movements of um, the body and extremities. These can be um, lead to trouble in the patient and the major side effects of these medications is actually going to warrant us stopping these medications. This list here, actually these just become too severe and they actually will stop the medications altogether. On the flip side of this now is anticholinergic medications, which we're gonna to use to try and balance too much expression of the acetylcholine, which again is happening because of the dopamine relationship. Um, we're not expressing enough dopamine, so the acetylcholine is going up. So again, the ideal idea is treatment is we're going to try and give the dopamine, dopaminergic medications to restore the balance of dopamine. But if that doesn't work or it's not entirely effective, sometimes we'll add an anticholinergic medication in order to block the acetylcholine, which is again being overexpressed. Uh, this is not as effective as the dopaminergic medications, but it's often used early stages of Parkinson therapy. Uh, some examples include um, cogentin. That's actually the most common. That's why it's underlined. The benzo, uh, benzo, benzotropine, cogentin is much easier to say. Um, if we think about anticholinergic drugs, we think that these typically have some pretty significant side effects. And you can go back to that lesson and review those if you um, don't have those memorized yet. And then finally, Alzheimer's disease. It's the second most common cause of degeneration in the central nervous system, and it's responsible for approximately 70% of all dementias. Alzheimer's disease is a progressive loss of brain function. It can lead to memory loss, confusion, and dementia. For the most part, it affects people over the age of 50. People can have it younger and younger. That it's, typ that it's typical early onset isn't normal, um, but it can happen. It's very aggressive when it happens. Uh, but most of the time, people older than 50 and are much older than that, even when this um, happens. The thing about Alzheimer's is we don't really understand it very well. It's usually associated with cerebral atrophy, uh, which is which in the cerebral tissue is going to shrink and not be as effective or responsive. We believe there are some possible ca causes. About 10% of cases with people with Alzheimer's have a family history of Alzheimer's disease. There is a current theory that Alzheimer's is due to a chronic inflammation or oxidative cell damage, which is when we have free radicals outside the cell, which is essentially damaged cell that causes um, oxidative stress. There's not a whole lot we can do to reverse this. 
uh, there may be some other environmental factors too, some immune factors and maybe some nutritional factors as well. Um, there are some thoughts that previous viral exposure can lead to Alzheimer's disease. They found a little bit that people with herpes simplex virus at some point in their life are more prone to having Alzheimer's. Uh, and people with herpes who received antiviral uh, therapy did have lower rates among the population, um, but still the people with herpes were much higher than if they didn't. Again, we don't truly know what's happening with Alzheimer's. There's still a lot of research and I'm hoping, you know, within the next decade, we might um, have a different outcome or more education on, on Alzheimer's disease. We do know what happens in the brain is we have a structural damage with amyloid plaques and neural fibrillin tangles. I can't say that big long word, but you get plaques and tangles is actually the abbreviation. Um, we'll see those on the next slide. The problem is that these are typically very hard to see. You can't readily see them on any sort of CT or MRI. Um, they, they don't show up um, very readily. And so usually Alzheimer's disease is a symptom we diagnose based on symptoms alone. And it can really only be confirmed with an autopsy after the fact because we'll see those plaques and tangles um, at that point. And you can see here, this is what the healthy brain looks like. Um, you can see the difference here with the Alzheimer's disease, healthy neuron versus a diseased neuron. Symptoms re result from progressive damage in the neurons and the hippocampus, which is where we store our memories and we learn new things. So that makes sense. The area of the brain that's damaged is the hippocampus, um, and those are the symptoms that go along with it. Uh, the, the hippocampus requires acetylcholine as a major transmitter in order to function. This is where it's going to get a little confusing. In Parkinson's, we don't have enough dopamine leading to overexpression of acetylcholine. Not enough dopamine increases our acetylcholine. In Alzheimer's disease, we don't have enough acetylcholine in order to stimulate the hippocampus. Symptoms of Alzheimer's disease include impaired memory and judgment, confusion and disorientation. As it progresses, we see the inability to recognize family and friends. Depression is very common, which can be related to the loss of function, despair, and the hopelessness that comes along with this diagnosis. Sometimes you can develop psychosis, which can include paranoia and delusions. You may also see anxiety and, and aggressive behaviors, not because the person has become necessarily aggressive, but because this new situation that's scary um, and, the, and the patients are just confused and don't know their surroundings, it may cause them to respond aggressively. This disease will progress over time. As of now, there is no cure for Alzheimer's. The treatment for Alzheimer's is geared towards intensifying the effect of acetylcholine at the cholinergic receptors, particularly again in the hippocampus. It's not necessarily that we have an acetylcholine deficit, but the acetylcholine is the primary neurotransmitter for this specific area that promotes learning and memory. Drugs are only moderately, modestly effective and only effective in the very early stages of the disease. We are trying to provide more acetylcholine in order to try and stimulate the hippocampus or stop or slow the degeneration part of that brain. The goal is to slow memory loss, to slow dementia, and to try to maximize quality of life as long as we can. We try and improve activities of daily living and improve behavior and cognition while we can. After a while, though, these medications are going to become less and less effective. And then finally, their medications we use are called cholinergic agonists, called cholinesterase, I can't say this long word, cholinesterase inhibitors. They don't actually provide more acetylcholine, but what they do is prevent the breakdown of acetylcholine. Cholinesterase, I can't say that today, breaks down acetylcholine and these medications stop that. They help slow the progression of Alzheimer's disease, particularly in the very early stages. The most common one we give is Aricept. Um, I prescribe that um, not all the time because it's not the population of patients I care for a lot, but um, it is prescribed in the early stages to help kind of slow down that, um, slow down the memory loss and slow down the symptoms. Okay, so you've reached the end of this unit and again, the end of this module. The next exam will cover the last three lessons of this module, which include acid base, electrolytes and fluids, the pulmonary system and the neurological system. I've posted a module two overview short lecture that will help um, you prepare for the exam. It will serve as your study guide. Again, like the first exam, all of the questions come directly from the lectures. So review the three lectures in the lessons and review the short overview and that should help you prepare. The information on the exam itself will be posted in the course. As usual, please let me know if you have any questions or concerns and I look forward to continually working with you in this course.